I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah, and that Jesus Christ is his only Son, a prophet and Savior of the world, that there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ, the only Son, of the most sovereign, omnipotent God is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you, and God be glorified. And as Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Praise be to God. If you have your Bibles, turn away with me to the book, of 2 Timothy. Again, the book of 2 Timothy. The following scripture will be also 2 Timothy, but this scripture is 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. The supplicant scripture thereby will be 2 Timothy 4, 2 through 5. And the latter scripture I will give you will be Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 15. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, and Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 15. And the Word of God reads in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, and it says, all scriptures are, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And if you please, if you can go to... 2 Timothy 4, just drop down right there, you see it. 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 5, and it reads, it says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. If you please just casually turn to your left and, uh, and we'll bump into Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And how we're living in a time now where people are a little bit apprehensive about the word of God. Romans 10 verse 13 through 15 and it reads and it says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And I'm going to use for a text this morning preachers who are afraid to tell the truth. Preachers who are afraid to tell the truth. 
This word here is in particularly for uh, leaders in the church, those that have leadership position, as well as ministers in the church, those that are pastors, and yes, even bishop. Uh, God has told me to tell you, just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Now, if you go in your Bibles to 2 Timothy, let's go there again, looking at verse 1 and verse 7. 2 Timothy, verse 1 and 7. I believe we have preachers today that uh, love the title, but don't want to ruffle any feathers. And as a result, there are many preachers that are going along to get along, to get in, to fit in, and trying to make people happy because they do not want to be disliked. And as a result of not wanting to be disliked, they just kind of be silent when it comes to truth. Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 7, and it reads, it says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You see, your mind got to be sound when you delivering this word. Let's go in your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1. And thereby we're going to give you some more and trust God that you can get an understanding that God does not want intimidating coward preachers to preach his word because people today can give you that look. And he already told you to be not afraid of their faces. So you can't properly preach the word of God if you're worried about what people think about you and how they feel about you. Jeremiah 1 and 8, and it read, let's read it together. It says, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Hear me now, preachers. He's saying, don't be afraid, because I got you. I got you. No matter what they do, no matter how they try to threaten you, and today we got preachers that are being intimidated. Got folks in the church trying to intimidate the preacher. If you, if you preach this, uh, I'm going to do that. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 2. Don't be afraid. Tell the truth, the whole truth. Nothing but the truth, so help you God. Why? Because they ain't going to like you anyway. If you, if, if, if you sit up and tell them a bunch of junk they want to hear, they're going to say you preach junk. And if you preach the truth, they're going to get mad because you're preaching the truth. I'm here to tell you today, preachers, you can't win it, but you will win it if you stay in Christ. Will the church say amen? amen. So Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 6, let us read it together. It says, and thou son of man, be not what? Afraid of them, neither be afraid of what? Their words, though brief and thorn." Be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their be not afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their what? Look, though they be a rebellious house. So he's trying to he, God is giving you a warning that you're gonna see some people that are gonna look at you crazy when you're dealing with the truth. Uh, John 8 and 32 says it this way. It says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So again, this message is entitled, or text is, Preachers Who Are Afraid to Tell the Truth. And again, it's for leaders, ministers, pastors, bishops. All God wants you to do is just tell the truth. Don't worry about how they're going to respond to the truth. Don't get caught up in if they're going to like the truth. Just tell the truth. Preach the 
truth, preach the word of God, and let God deal with people hard. Will the church say amen? So the question is, what are, who is true? The fact is, truth is a fact. So when Pilate was talking to Jesus, he asked a bodacious question. He said, what is truth? But as you would notice that Jesus did not even respond to the what because Jesus was standing in front of him. So he asked Jesus a inappropriate question. The question should have been, who is true? And Jesus would have told him in St. John 14, verse 6, where it says that I am the what? Way. I am the truth. And I am the life. See, there is the truth, but there are many people talking about a truth. So you want the truth because that's what Jesus told, told the, uh, Pilate that he is the truth. But Pilate never got to, to the question of who is true. So I want you to know today, church, and for the ministers and the leaders that are listening to this word, if you are called to preach you have a responsibility to God to tell the truth. There is no applicable truth without flowing in God's grace. Truth without grace is like lungs without oxygen. You need them both. And if you're going to tell the truth, you must have a greater responsibility in telling the truth of God to those that come on Sunday or to those that you see during the week, you must tell them the truth. If you're called by God, you're known as a truth teller. If you're called by God, you're known as the man or the woman of the book. And the book is the word of God. In the Hebrew, the word for call is gara. That's G-A-R-A. -A. In the Greek, it is called kaleo, which means to call. There is a calling by the Holy Ghost, which is effectuous. The effectuous calling of God is tantamount to his sovereign choice. The effectual calling of God is the work of God in behalf of each elect person under grace. So if you are a leader, you are a minister, you are a pastor, you are different from your congregation. Your call will be proven and it should be pure and sure that God has called you. Note here, those that are called are referred to as the call according to his purpose. Romans 8 and 28 says that there can be, well, it doesn't say it, but Romans 8 and 28, the call according to his purpose, all things Work it together for the good to them that are the call according to his purpose. Many times we read that verse and we try to make everybody in that verse. But those that are called according to his purpose, that the verse applies to you. Because some people are not called according to God's purpose. They're called according to do what they want to do. And as a result, they may not reap the benefits of God. Know this, church, that there can be no calling without belief or trust. There can be no belief or trust without hearing. No, there can be no hearing without preaching. Uh-huh, and there can be no preaching unless the preacher have a commission or been sent. Many times we have people getting up in front of people that God has not approved, nor has God released for them to preach. Let me say it again. There can be no calling 
without belief or trust. And note here that belief or trust will be tested. There can be no belief or trust without hearing. If you say you're called a minister, you must first heard the call of God on your life telling you you are called a ministry. Grandmama can't call you. Aunt Lucy can't call you. Nobody can call you but God. And when God call you, he don't call you because you're perfect. Many times he'll call you in your imperfection. And when he call you in your imperfection, it becomes his job to perfect you as you move into your calling. That's why it's critical for us to know who are we listening to. Did Grandma Sadie call you? Did the old woman that's 99 in the church call you because you show up on Sunday? Maybe you're the only one that show up and spend some time with her. And she said, boy, you got a call on your life. No, you're just being a good person. Because you're a good person doesn't mean you're called. Because you're a good person doesn't mean you're called. Because you open up the door for somebody don't mean you're called. Because you have the gift of the gab does not mean you're called. Because you can talk that thing, preach that thing, and you have the gift of persuasion does not mean that you're called. For the call, when God call you, he call you, not the pastor. He call you, not the bishop. He call you, not the deacon. He call you, not your mama. He call you, not your daddy. He call you, not your sisters or your brothers. He call you, not yourself. When God call you, he will prove you with the things that he take you through. We have a lot of people that slick with it, got slick mouths and got the gift of the gap. And they think because they was born to be able to talk that they got the call to preach. And many of them are filling up these churches deceiving folks because if you can't take it, you won't make it. Because the devil is going to come at you with everything he got. And he loves to deflate preachers. Because preachers have been inflated with themselves. So when we say that there can be no calling without belief or trust, there can be no belief or trust without hearing, there can be no hearing without preaching. There can be no preaching unless preachers have been commissioned or sent. You see, reaching men for God begins with the commission of the messenger. Uh-huh. Through preaching, hearing, and trust. Men are brought to call upon the name of God. They're brought to call upon the name of the Lord. So the more you preach it, the more you must live it. It's no such thing I'm going to preach this message and then just go and live like the devil, act like a fool and, and do all kind of crazy stuff. And I just want you to know that you don't do what I do. You do what I tell you to do. Look to your neighbor and say, and the devil is a lie. You know, you got to learn to walk this thing. That's, that's why you got to have his grace and his mercy. We fall down, but we're getting back up. I'm just trying to tell you there's only two positions you ever see a true believer and a true preacher or a man or woman of God. You either see them getting up or standing up. There's only two positions they're going to be in. Preachers don't wallow in their mess. They don't sit down and lay down all day, every day. They normally standing up or getting up. Why? Because life will give you a gut shot. Life will give you an uppercut. Life will hit you hard. You may fall down, but I'm here to tell you, if you got the power of God and if you are called by God, just the calling alone will raise you back up. You don't want to be no mediocre preacher telling people stuff that you don't believe. And today we are laboring under the curse of preachers who are afraid to tell the truth. The world seems to be bullying the church while some preachers are afraid to stand up, speak up, and proclaim the word of God to the masses for fear of 
what will happen to them? What will happen to their pretty churches? What will happen to their lifestyle? Therefore, we have preachers just kind of go through the motion. They just kind of tell you what they think you want to hear. And since they are cowards in the pulpit, and since they have not recognized the true call, because when you really call what others think about you, make no difference. There's no such thing as that if everybody in the church, your best friend, the preacher got a problem. Because people will normally gravitate to you when they know there's certain things you won't talk about. If you got some liars in the church and you never preach on lying, your liar is going to be your best friend. Somebody say amen. Now, this message to leaders, ministers, and, and to pastors and bishops, if, if you got some whoremongers in the church and, and, and you slipping and tipping yourself, the whoremonger is going to be your best friend. Can somebody say, that's why we need grace? We got to have grace to preach this word of God. And for the preachers that are walking around and, and preaching legalistic gospel, while you're preaching it, you know, as James told us, you preaching something that you can't live yourself. You got to be transparent with the word of God and let the church know I'm wrestling with the same demon you wrestling with. You ain't got to be afraid to tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Just tell the truth. Because the church is going through a thunderstorm. And we have those that are outside the church that are just kind of looking at the church and laughing at us. The church have allowed itself through these uh, frightened leaders. Have allowed itself to go along to get along. We have brought the club into the church, and now everybody is, is in the church doing the boogaloo, got all kind of praise stuff, and it's amazing to me that years ago when I was coming up that the church was the last place to have all this mess that we got up in the church today. And, and you think that everybody gets saved, that the world will come to church and they do their little thing and got the big screen and everybody, you think everybody gets saved. I mean, if, if you got to go through all those loops and hoops to get them to come in, you think you would think you get some fruit of it. But how many of you know that they'll leave your club and go to the club for real, have a party at church, and have a party in the world and never get saved? From the millennials that I've been talking to and others, they want something different. They don't want to be like the world. They, want, they really want to do something different. They don't want to talk like the world, walk like the world. They want to do something different. So when they come to church, they want to see a representation of the kingdom of God. So we've dumbed it down so much until we're telling the millennials, you can't live holy. And the millennials are saying, you're a lie. Yes, I can. I can live like my grandmama Lucy. I can live like my mother. I can be chased. I don't have to be whoring around. I don't have to drink. I don't have to smoke. I don't have to go to the club. Show me the image of how I'm supposed to live. That's what the millennials are saying, and I will live it for the kingdom of God. The church has been dumbing down because we want everybody to like us. Oh, I got a cool pastor. You know, he even go to the club every now and then. He said, you know, just show up at the club because you can win souls in the club. I mean, we got this thing so twisted because every place Jesus went, he was in the street. He walked the street, talked to folks on the block. But you can't tell me Jesus was in the club. Holler back. I never saw Jesus in the club and reading the scriptures. I never saw him hanging around a woman on a pole. Somebody say amen. When he went out, he was intentional. Will the church say intentional? He was intentional to go out to win those that was lost. When he went to Zacchaeus' house, he wasn't drinking and smoking and getting high, telling me I got to do this to get him. He went to see Zacchaeus hanging up in a tree. He went there and won him to Christ. What's the point? See, when you want to do stupid things, you justify them by using the word of God. Now, the young folks don't know where the club at. They say, well, hey, I, I thought the club was in the world, but hey, it looked like the club is in the church. 
Why? Because leaders have compromised. And I know you pastors, you're probably getting mad at me hearing me say this. You may think, who do he think he is? I, I, I tell you who I am. I'm a man that is undone. I open up with what Paul said. But by the grace of God, <laughs> I am what I am. I am undone. I, I, am, I am messed up from the neck up. And the only way that I can do what I do is through the grace of God and his mercy. I, I am trying to present to you a living epistle. That at times, if he's not truly connected to God, can and will fall. But as I fall, on, you know those two positions. Can everybody say two positions? For a real man that's called, real woman that's called, a real believer, he's either what? Getting up. It may be tough. And he's standing up. Why? Because he's going to get knocked down from time to time. And you got to know that. You got to know that you got to walk in it. So you preachers that are hearing me this morning, as a preacher, walking in grace, I have the grace to tell you the truth. We cannot let fear direct our path. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I say unto you today, my brothers and sisters, don't be afraid to tell people the truth. Don't be afraid to tell people that at times you struggle at night. Don't be afraid to tell people that maybe you're coming out of pornography or maybe you're coming out of certain things. Now, I know that as preachers and men and women of God, there are some things that congregations should never know about you. Because when they begin to see all of your flaws, they begin to distrust you. And they begin to put you in a category as, uh, why am I following him when he's so jacked up? Most people today are looking for perfection, even though they know they will never find it. They want to see someone that at least moving towards it. If your life is jacked up and it's a three or four out of ten, they, they will find themselves trying to minister to you as the pastor. So there's some things that you don't need to reveal, but you need to let them know that, yes, I have a struggle. How many of you have a struggle in here? You have a struggle that you're wrestling with. You got your own private demon that you fight every day. You got one that you done cast him out, you done stomped him out, you done got him prayed for, and, and that stronghold that keeps coming into your life, and you get mad at yourself when that thing takes you over from time to time. Know this, Paul had, he had, he had something in his flesh. He said, there was a thorn in my flesh. I suggest to you, maybe the thorn in his flesh was his flesh. If you would take your mind to understand that, you, you'd probably smile. And this is what Paul was said. Uh, he thanking God for the revelation, for the revelation of grace. <laughs> and God says, don't worry about it, Paul. My grace is sufficient. How many of you in here got some stuff that you know you need some real grace on? Come on, raise your hand. See, I love a transparent church because a transparent church can deal with people that are not transparent. Have you ever been around somebody that tried to act like Moses? Like they keeping all the law and getting mad at you when you got some freedom. <laughs> you know God got you. You know God has delivered you. And you look at them and you know they can't be keeping the 613. And the devil is a lie. You're going to try to keep, get me to keep what you can't keep? You're going to try to get me to obey what you can't obey? No, it's impossible because the enemy wants us to live our lives in, in a fictitious manner, thinking that we can keep the word of God. But go to James chapter 2, if you please. Hear me now, preachers. I know you may be mad, but I love you. I love you. And that's why I got to tell you the truth. There are over 613 commandments, 
And James chapter 2 verse 10 tells us this. Now somebody want to say what well, the commandment was in the Old Testament. Well, James talking about him now. And James was Jesus' brother. Now don't get no closer than that. James was Jesus' brother. And James here is telling us something. Will the church say amen? Let's read it together. It says James 2 verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Look to your neighbor and say, grace, grace. grace. Come on, say it like you mean it. Say, grace, grace. grace. Now let's read it one more time because, see, there's a preacher right now hearing me right now. He mad because he want to be Moses. So since he can't be Moses no more, uh-huh, he, he mad at me because I'm exposing the fact that if you would tell the truth to the church and let people know that they can't live this gospel without Jesus Christ, when they know that, they will automatically bow and submit themselves to the grace of God. James chapter 2, verse 10. Let's read it together. Read it out loud and read it with authority. Act like you know it. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay, Moses. I don't know what else God needs to tell you, but I'm under grace. I can't keep 613 commandments. Now that's 613. That's a lot of them. And I have to keep them daily. But the devil wants you to think that you're the worst person on the planet because you haven't been told that God loves you in spite of how bad you may be. James also warns us that those who aspire to lead and to teach others must be judged with a greater strictness than the rank and file. What does that mean? That means that those that are called themselves leaders and ministers and pastors and bishops, you're not getting away because nothing happened to you today. You may get by, but you won't get away. That's why we have to tell people the truth, even if it hurts you. If you know if you're wrestling with something and you're struggling with it, don't pretend that you're not. Admit the fact, go home and pray. And the beautiful thing about this, thank you, Holy Spirit, the beautiful thing about this is that God will allow preachers to go through things because it gives us a tender spot for those that are in the church that are wrestling with the same thing. Hear me now, church. If you ain't going through something, then how are you going to talk me out of it? So when you're going through something, that's why God told Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient. Don't worry about it. I got it. But now, because the tendency, if you think you got yourself all together, you'll walk around heady and high-minded and swolled up like you better than everybody else. It's called self-righteousness. You see a crackhead and you think, oh, well, I'm not a crackhead. You see somebody drunk all the time. All oh, them people really need to get their self together. You see somebody going through stuff where they're struggling, the money ain't right. Man, it's been 10 years. Why can't they get their life together? That's why God will allow certain things to happen to preachers and ministers and leaders to keep you humble. To keep you humble. And if you're wise, you'll use your situation to minister to other people. That's what God wants for your life. Hear me now, preachers. You wondering why your car keep going on a flat and a crackhead got to help you out? It's because God wants you to know that you ain't all that. You wondering why things bad keep happening to you? God saying, I'm going to use the foolishness of the preaching to save men's souls. So, so the best thing to do is to humble yourself. Look to your neighbor and say, just humble yourself. 
you need to humble yourself because God wants us to tell the truth. You know, see, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. See, if you're afraid to tell people the truth, that means that you really don't have love for them. Hear me now. See, you're so conditioned to get people to like you that you refuse to tell them what's in your heart. Stay with me now. Now, what does that mean? That simply means that you rather lie and keep the friendship than to tell the truth and go through the pain. True friends are won by going through the struggle. You know, there's a fusion that you go through when you meet someone in a relationship. And if you're around somebody and say, well, my best friend, we ain't never had an argument. Y'all lying. Somebody is manipulating somebody else. How is that going to be your best friend and you never had an argument? Somebody is just letting them get away with some stuff. It's called managing manipulation. You've been, you're a good manager of deceiving and manipulating people because you don't want the confrontation. Because the confrontation will prove your friendship. And as a pastor, as a minister, as a leader of the church, a bishop, confrontation is what caused people to grow. And we live in this time now where people don't want, I don't want them mad at me. I don't want them looking at me. Why they got to be mad? That's what caused them to grow. But we're in the touchy-feely time now where everybody want to be happy. And if you tell them something that they don't like, they get mad and leave your church. Hear me now, preachers. You think they're leaving your church because of you, but they're leaving your church because they are babies that have not learned to be under discipline. They've been around so many people that have always let them do what they want to do, and when they get around someone that's going to preach the word and don't care about you paying your tithes, don't care about you giving your offering, don't care about you saying amen or not, don't care about what you're talking about, when you get around somebody that's going to preach this word to you and don't care about your feelings, then those are the people that will stay with you. The one that will stay will know you preaching to them because of the love of God that's in you. Yeah, they're going to pack out your church when everything you're getting is cotton candy and popcorn. I mean, no children like sweets. Talk to me now. Holla back. I got grandkids and all they want is some sugar. They'll track you down like a bloodhound. Trying to get some mints. And you mention ice cream, oh, Lord. Throw some cotton candy in there. Kids will track you down for some cotton candy, some Fruit Loops, some Apple Jacks. Somebody say amen. Some Frosted Flakes. Somebody want to get no cereal where you got to add something to it. They want, the, they want the sugar already in it. Somebody say amen. And we have some believers that want the sugar in the Word. And when they don't get the sugar in the word, they say, oh, he, he, just, he preached too hard or, or he, he, he don't care nothing about nobody. Well, a real preacher going, when you got them canines coming out your mouth, I mean, you got real teeth in your mouth. A preacher that care about you ain't going to always feed you cornflakes or frosted flakes. He ain't going to always give you some cotton candy when you bite, when you bite very beautiful and, and full of air. When you bite into it, there's nothing there. Preacher ain't going to give you no cotton candy. He's going to give you some steak. He's going to give you some cornbread. He's going to give you some greens. He's going to give you some collard greens. He's going to give you some chicken. He's going to give you some Kool-Aid, something that he know you can digest in your heart. 
If you want cotton candy, you go to cotton candy churches. Where people just, <laughs> they just like to make you happy. It becomes inspirational, motivational, and intoxicating because you really think that you're getting a word. You know how some people say, I'm going to that church because I can get a word over there. If you stop playing with your preacher and start pulling from him. See, see, your issue is not your preacher. You have accepted the imposter. See, you think preaching is one way. Preaching has never been one way. If you're listening to a man or woman of God and they're preaching a word that you know is jacked up, you know it's stupid. You know it's crazy. You know it don't line up. It's your responsibility to come down, get in that line, and ask him for an appointment to talk to him about the word that he gave you that you know didn't line up. You have to be responsible for the word of God that you hear. That's why, the, that's why the word says try the spirit what? By the spirit. Oh, they're just a pastor. He know what he's talking about. Uh -huh. They're just a pastor. We love that pastor. Leave the pastor alone. He know what he's talking about. The pastor could be just as dumb as a box of rocks. Uh, I know you don't like to hear stuff like this here. But what do I tell you while we come to church? We come to church to serve, right? And to get a word, right? And to examine that word for what? What? We examine that word for what? Then after we examine it for truth, we apply it to what? Ourselves. After we know that it's real, then we apply it to what? Our family. Then after that, then we take it to the world. There is no sense in passing a word on that you are struggling with. I don't care who it came from. But see, when you get used to the cotton candy, as long as it's sweet and full of air, bite into it, there's nothing there. You think you got something and you leave church. And when you get home and them demons start coming at you. Ain't nobody talking about Casper the Friendly Ghost. We talking about some real demons. I'm talking about some demons that are coming to kill you. You got to know you got some word in you. Will the church say amen? Hallelujah. But see, there are some that are preaching in the pulpit that are building the magic kingdom with a club atmosphere, many celebrity attractions, movie screens and entertainment, and great events with popcorn and cotton candy in order to keep the people happy and dumb. Telling them the truth of God, refusing, excuse me, to tell them the truth of God. Most believers today don't know the truth, can't handle the truth, and really don't want to hear the truth because we have been so engraved into the world. Well, my best friend is a homosexual, so ain't no sense in preaching on that because, uh, you know, we got to love the people in. Well, see, love demands truth. You can't say you love your homosexual friend or your transsexual friend or your lesbian friend, or, 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 and, and then you got the nerve want to stick them up in heaven. Y'all don't mind if I unpack this for a moment. We got preachers in the pulpit that are, that are gay. Pastors gay, and everybody's saying, well, ain't nothing wrong with that, and the devil is a lie. There's a lot wrong with that. How you going to say that you're a man or woman of God, and you sleeping with another man? How are you going to say you're a woman of God when all of your friends are lesbian and you call yourself just hanging out with them? Look to somebody and say, birds of a feather do flock together. 
And if you ain't one, you hanging with one, just a matter of time before what was in you come out of you. It's amazing to me how, how we want to accept that because they, they're not your friends. You're doing them a disservice by saying, well, they're gay and we got to show love. That's what's wrong with the church. We got to show love tells the truth and love demands a verdict. And the verdict is guilty. Why? Because the truth of God's word says he made them male and female. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, money, you come down here, and Theo, you come down here right out front. Be quick, be quick, be quick. You guys line up right here. Slide over a little bit. Do you, Theo, take your money to be your lawful wedded wife? <laughs> Do you, your money, take Theo to be your lawful wedded husband? Now, now you see how crazy that look. Talk to me. Do you see how crazy that look? Will somebody talk to me? Talk to me. Two grown men tell me they love each other and never can have a baby. You two may sit down. Isabella, you and Kathy come up here for a moment. Be quick, be quick, be quick. See, I want you to see the point because see, sometimes we think because the world accepted that is all right. I, I, I now come to you and ask you, Kathy, do you take Isabella as your husband? And I come to ask you, do you take Kathy as your wife? Okay, you may be seated. You need to stop lying. You got to tell the world the truth. How you going to be a preacher, a man of God, a woman of God, and you see that abomination, you see that mess, you know that mess, you know that ain't from God, but yet you married him, and the devil is a lie. You got to demand that your pastors and your ministers tell you the truth. Well, how you going to know the truth if you don't read the truth for yourself? You've been listening to everybody else, but you got to know the word for yourself. Uh, how two men going to have a baby when they throw in seed in the drought? Tell me that. How two men are going to have a baby when they're throwing seed in the drought. It's like throwing a brand new born baby into a cesspool of nothing but waste and manure. You going to try to convince me that God says that's okay? Not only do the homosexuals have a problem, the preachers that marry them have a bigger problem. Now, don't be hating, preachers. I'm just stating. You see, there are some things that are just common sense. Some things are just common sense. But see, if you under vile affection, then you no longer have common sense. And if you're compromising to go along and get along, and, and you're, trying to, you're trying to friend them, <laughs> then you lose your common sense. Why? Because you ain't anchored in the word of God. Well, Pastor Curry, don't take all that. We have to love them. As long as two people love each other, there is nothing wrong. Well, how many of you know that two people can love each other, but if they're practicing an abominable act, that doesn't make their love stop. The act makes them perverts. Because they're going against what the word of God said. That's why it's important to know the book for yourself. Can everybody say, we people are the book? Come on, hold up the book. This who you are. Bump what your pastor's saying. If he ain't coming out the book, you better know this word for yourself. Look to your name and say, know it for yourself. 
I'm trying to help you, church. Know the word of God for yourself. And if the pastor talking crazy, come up and make an appointment with him and have a meeting with him and say, sir, can you explain this? Stop being intimidated by these leaders. Write your question down. In Bible study, ask him the question. Well, where's that verse? How does this work? Where's that scripture? See, preachers don't like me saying this. It's going to be all right. You know, the reason why they don't want you to challenge them is because you may be right and they may be wrong. Hear me now. But if he's a good preacher, he first called himself a student of the word. He first understand that he can be corrected. And if he don't want to be corrected, then he's moving in pride and arrogance. And it doesn't matter if you try to correct him. Now I'm saying doing it in love. I'm not saying call your pastor out. Get this now. Don't call him out. Don't tell him he's a liar. I know about saying none of that. I'm saying make an appointment. Go to him humbly and saying, sir, I do not understand how this works. The demons are screaming right now. You know why they're screaming? Because the demons want congregations happy and dumb. Anything the pastor say, yep, yep. Won't read it for yourself. I'm not interested in you being happy and dumb. I want you to know what I know and more. So if you see me about to run off the cliff, hold up, pastor. (laughs) There's a drop coming. And I'll be looking and say, well, thank you very much. Look to your neighbor and say, iron, shop, and iron. But we have those that are creating the magic kingdom. They want celebrities, popcorn, cotton candy. As long as you're happy and dumb, you you, you don't know how to read. You You don't know how to trust God. Don't know how to go in and get the word for yourself. Ain't got no commentary. You just go to church and... And have people to entertain you, do backflips and do all this this stuff. And you lead the service and say, boy, we had a real good service today. And you ask the question, well, what did you learn? Well, uh, what did I learn? How about just saying nothing? Why? Because you don't demand from your preacher. See, if someone is teaching you, you have a right to demand. That's why Jesus was getting all upset with his disciples. He said, you guys haven't figured this out yet? Well, I got to keep going over the same stuff because they placed no demand on the word that they was getting. You got to demand. Those of you that are in this church, demand that I teach you right. Demand that I preach right. Demand that I study. Demand that I know what I'm talking about. Do you hear me up in here? Demand it. Demand it. How do you demand it? You demand it by you studying yourself. You can't put a demand on a thing that you know nothing about. If you want to be lazy, you will never have a demand. You don't care what mama fixes because you're hungry. You just want to eat some. But when you put a demand on it, you're now telling mama, mama, is it possible that we can eat some greens and cornbread and, and, and you know that chicken that I like? Mama said, well, baby, I didn't even know that you wanted me to cook that. How many hear what I'm talking about? I didn't even know that you wanted me to cook that. I cooked that for you about three years ago. I just thought you really didn't like it. But since I know you liked it, since I know you demanding it. See, you get cotton candy because that makes it easy for preachers to talk to you that way. But when you demand that they teach you a real word, now they got to go get where? In the book. Can somebody say, we're people of the book? See, if you are a person of the book, you got a right to demand that I stay a man of the book, the word of God. But if you are not a man or woman of the book, you will receive everything that I say to you without challenging the word that comes out of my mouth. 
I'm here today to tell you, church, when you know the truth, you will recognize the truth when you hear the truth, and then you will be able to say, amen, which means so be it. Look to your neighbor and say, don't be a dumb believer. Hmm. If some preachers want bigger churches without having bigger people, thus producing a weaker church. The craziest part about it is that people today in the church have no compassion. They don't want to serve. And many times they want to be served. And they want to be put up front like somehow they're Mr. and Mrs. Special. But when it comes down to serving people, they get angry. And they get mad at you, preachers, when you have to go take care of the toilet ministry. That's a great ministry for an arrogant person to have. Because once you get through smelling them aromas and cleaning up the toilet, you'll come to know real quick that you ain't all that you think you are. Proud people don't want to do dirty work. Proud people don't want to run with the thoroughbreds. They like to dress up like the Clydesdales. Proud people really don't want to get dirty. They, they think themselves to be above that. But as preachers, we have to preach the word of God to those that call themselves proud. So you want a bigger church? You want a bigger church or do you want bigger people? I'm looking for bigger people. You see, to be a true man or woman of God, you must overcome your pride. So if you're a preacher or a pastor or a leader or a minister or a bishop, your greatest issue is always going to be your pride. Can't nobody tell you nothing. You know everything. You got all the answers. You get mad when someone disagree with you. How many know some preachers like that? I mean, you can raise your hand. I ain't going to call them and tell them on you. When you disagree with them, they get mad. Pastors and preachers and ministers and leaders and bishops hold just as much grudges as some of the congregation do. Now, see, they're going to be mad when they hear this because they're saying, I'm telling all their business. No, I'm just telling the truth. Look to your neighbor and say, just tell the truth. Why would they get angry and get mad? Because they're human just like you. They're frustrated. They're tired. And there's some preachers that want to quit. It's already recorded that over 1,500 pastors are leaving ministry every month. And some say more every year. Why? Because they can't deal with their pride. One man had a church that had 5,000 people. He had a big church fight, and all of a sudden it went down to uh, close to 2,000. He got mad and quit. Why did he quit? Because he wasn't in it to begin with. We don't quit if there's one that needs to be taught. That one can reach a 1,000. The scripture says one can what? Chase a 1,000 and two can chase 10,000. There's one of you in this church by hearing the word of God over and over again, God can use just one to reach billions. But if you don't believe that, you will excuse the fact when you, you look at the church saying, well, the church is small. There's no such thing as a small church. You look at small as not having a lot of people. But how many of you know that dynamite comes in what? Small packages. God is not looking at the number. Hear me now, church. God is looking at his kingdom. His kingdom is millions upon millions. You just happen to come to this place to meet God. You have to see yourself as part of a worldwide church. A church where God releases power every day. Will the church say amen? Hallelujah. So as preachers, the main thing preachers struggle with is pride, fear, and ego. And the tendency is that 
when the people are not doing what we want them to do, we get mad and, and we start preaching crazy sermons in the pulpit because we're mad. And how many know that you can't do that as a preacher? You can't take it out on God's people because, know this, they're not your people. They really are God's people. Hallelujah. So as a preacher, I have the grace to tell you the truth. Not only the, to the truth to the, the congregation, but the truth to other preachers. As preachers, we are to protect and serve the people of God from the wolves in sheep clothing. However, we must not become the wolf that we're trying to protect them from. As a preacher, I have the grace to tell you the truth that we must keep the word of God in our mouth day and night for maximum kingdom results. We must always preach and teach in love. We just need to tell the people the truth. As a preacher, you are not responsible for getting people stuff such as cars and homes and money and causing them to feel like they're prospering because they got stuff. That's, that's not a preacher's job. That's not a pastor's job. That's not a leader's job. That's not a bishop's job. Our job is not to preach so you get stuff. Our job is to preach so you can understand Matthew 6 and 33. That if ye seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the stuff that you need will come unto you. Will the church say amen? As a preacher, I have the grace to tell you the truth. You can't treat people different because they have lots of money. In other words, you don't want to have a uh, a, a VIP session for those that are rich because God will send someone rich that you'll send to the balcony and he'll be a billionaire. The point is, is that we have to treat people right without partiality. We can't just say, well, we want the big time folks to sit up front and those that ain't got much money to sit in the back. We begin to go against the word of God. We have to just tell the truth. As a preacher... I have the grace to tell you the truth that you should never condone homosexuality agenda in the church or out of the church. We should not condone sin. Galatians 5 verse 19 through 21 talks about the work of the flesh. So as a preacher, we shouldn't be happy because we got a bunch of sinners in the church. Somewhere along the line, they need to change their mind and get saved and live a kingdom lifestyle. Will the church say amen? So as a preacher, we got to tell people the truth. Look to your neighbor and say, just tell me the truth. See, I would rather to be around someone that would tell me the truth than to tell me a lie. If you know I got some problems and you know I'm doing something wrong, just tell me the truth. And that's what the world is calling the church to do. Tell us the truth. Talk to us. You've heard the phrase, talk to me. The world is saying, talk to me. Tell me the truth. What should I do to be saved? And we need preachers that can tell the truth and talk to the world and let the world know that we care about it. Will the church say Amen. As preachers, I have the grace to tell you the truth that people that are, are different need to be warned that they're different. In other words, all of us are not the same. All of us are not acting the same. All of us don't do the same thing. We need to tell the truth about it, that it's okay to be different. It's okay when things ain't working out. Just tell the truth. Will the church say amen? As a preacher, you need to tell your people that Sometimes you are embarrassed by how selfish they can be. Hear me now, preachers. It's okay to tell your people that at times you're embarrassed because they're just too selfish. They won't act right. They won't line up. They won't do right. But see, when preachers say things like that, the congregation say, why are he messing with us? No, people need to know that there's another level you need to go to. Why are you so selfish? Why every time somebody say something, you mad? Why you always frustrated? Why it look like you've been baptized in lemon juice? Why is it that you always upset? Why is it that you always got your mouth poked out? 
Why did that when somebody say something to you, you always hollering? The preachers need to tell the truth. That's not a Christian behavior. That's a fleshly behavior. Will the church say amen? So as a preacher, I'm talking to the preachers now. As a preacher, I have the grace to tell you the truth. Tell the people that you're not their God. I know you preach good and you done got in the rhythm of hoopology. You went to school to study hooping. And you got your rhythm down. And as long as that ham and organ is playing, you good. But how many of you know that there are some that are coming out of that because when you get through hooping and hollering and running around the church, them folks ain't heard a word you said. They love to hear you squall. And when you get through squalling, they still ain't got nothing. Somebody say amen. These people today need to be taught. They need to know a real word so that when they leave the church, they got something. Will the church say amen? You got to understand as preachers, we got to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Even if that truth that we're saying hurt us, we still got to tell the truth. Will the church say amen? Hallelujah. So tell the people you're not their God. Tell the people that the building is not yours nor theirs. Tell the people the building belongs to God. We must teach people to go to go out of the church that people can go and witness to those that are lost. Tell the people the truth. As a preacher, tell the people that they are not as loving as they think they are. What would happen if the pastors across the, across the land would tell people, you know what, y'all get on my nerve. What if you just be transparent and say, you know what, just like Moses said, I'm sick of these stiff-necked people. But see, preachers don't want to say that because they think they're going to hurt your feelings. But see, if they built you up strong enough, they'll never have to say it. Why? Because you want to live according to the plan of God. Because if you don't tell the people the truth as men and women of God, you build up a hidden resentment for, the, for those that you're trying to win. You build up the pressure. And the people can sense that something is wrong with you. Will the church say amen? As a preacher, God gave me the grace to tell you the truth. Tell the people that they are not as loving as they think they are. Tell the people that they need to grow up and go out and reach the lost. Stop gossiping. Grow up, go out, and reach the lost. Stop gossiping. Grow up, go out, and reach the lost. As preachers, we need to tell them that. As preachers, the word of God should never stop coming out of our mouth. It should never stop coming out of our mouth. We should never preach angry. We should never be preaching the blame game. We should be serious about the words that we say. As a preacher, we should not be fooled by the praise of people today. But no, they will crucify you on the cross tomorrow. You see, people will say, yes, hallelujah, praise the Lord, and, and they'll pat you on the back. But in the morning time, you'll find out they got a dagger planned for you. That's why you got to preach the word of God, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke with all long suffering. You got to preach the word and don't worry about what people think about you. If you want to be liked, preaching is not the place to be. If you want everybody to like you and say, oh, I love my pastor, that's fine if they really love you. But sometimes they will say that to manipulate you to get what they want out of you. Will the church say amen? And as I close, Isaiah said it when he said it this way, Isaiah 51 in verse 7, C clause. He said, fear not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their reveling. Verse 12, Isaiah said it this way. He said, who art thou that thou should be afraid of men that shall die? Isaiah making it clear that you're afraid of someone that's going to die. Don't be afraid of him. Preach the word. And Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 7 said, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thy own understanding. And all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. 
So as a preacher, we are called to always tell the truth, even if that truth hurt us. We are not to hold back the truth of God's word for anyone at any time. Preach the word of God by telling the truth. And when you tell the truth, you're honoring God. When you tell the truth, you're letting people know that you trust God. When you tell the truth, you're going to get some backlashes. When you tell the truth, they are going to talk about you. When you tell the truth, but never tell the truth when it's not mixed in grace. The very thing you talk about the most can be the very thing that can come and hurt you the most. If you know you're an adulterer, if you know you're a liar, and you're running around talking bad about everybody else, it's just a matter of time before that truth that you're preaching about will come up against you. Be transparent. Tell people who, that you're human. Let people know that you're subject to make mistakes. Let people know that you're not all that. Let people know that you will fall. Let people know, but you're going to get back up. Let people know that you're living this life just like they are. You just have been appointed to be a, a leader. You've been appointed to be a minister. You've been appointed to be a pastor or a bishop. Let them see you like you really are. And when you do, I believe God will begin to elevate the church, elevate the ministry, elevate the people that are in your life. Ye shall know the what? Truth. And the truth shall make you free. If you believe that, stand to your feet and give God a hand praise in the house of God.